There are certain things we're told as children not to discuss in polite company. Religion and politics. There are questions we're not supposed to ask. Someone's age and weight. And then there's class. An idea so tangled up with income, with inheritance, with worth, that we just don't talk about it. But it still exerts a powerful influence on how we see ourselves and others. In an effort to unpack this complicated and fraught idea, joining me today is Betsy Leander Wright, Program Director at Class Action, a national nonprofit aimed at inspiring people of all backgrounds to identify and address issues of class and classism. Betsy has led over 100 workshops across the U.S. on classism, cross-class alliance building, and economic inequality. And most recently, she is the author of Missing Class, Strengthening Social Movement Groups by Seeing Class Cultures. Welcome, Betsy. Thank you, Peter. Good to be with you. Thanks for joining me. So can you start us off with a working definition of class? Sure. Um, one of the reasons that class is hard to talk about is because it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. It's a number of interrelated spectrums of um, how our lives are, and our life chances are so different depending on our parents' education level and occupation and what neighborhood we grow up in and what kind of housing and then what kind of education we get and sure. what field we're in. So all those things um, combined yeah. um, make our, our lives really, really different from people with different class stories. So it's a, it's a complex of yes. ideas, of, of beliefs. Okay. Um, let's get personal with class. Going back to your class of origin or, or the class that you were born into um, and how that's informed you uh, and, and who you've become. I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey, um, and I did have some class mobility, upward mobility, during mm -hmm. my childhood, which I think made me curious about class. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly I say my background is upper middle class. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think that my life and this work has been very influenced by, by my class background. Um, in class action workshops, we, we co-facilitate usually with a mixed class and, and when possible, mixed race. Um, mm -hmm. training team and um, it's uh, so that we try to have it where everyone all the participants um, have someone that they feel more similar to and can mm -hmm. whose story they can relate mm -hmm. to more so I've I've told my class story um, you know breaking that to about a taboo you talked exactly. about exactly. you know just hundreds of times and right. um, I think it's a really surprising and energizing and can be startling or, or uncomfortable um, yeah. but it's an it's a um, to hear people just openly say the hardships of poverty that they grew up with or sure. the wealth and um, luxury that they grew up with yeah. just factually and calmly right. well in, in the fact that you said in 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 the class action workshops that there are people of varying classes who who lead the groups um, it, it, it sort of le le led to the next que question that I had, which was, has your particular class of, of origin and your current class, do you see that as a benefit or as, uh, as sort of as a, as a handicap in terms of leading workshops on class and, and facilitating open, open dialogue on the issue? Well, both. I think people from any background can do this work. Um, you know, I grew up very, very sheltered, um, and I think that um, there's a lot of downsides to growing up upper middle class, mm -hmm. um, despite the advantages and, and comforts. Um, there's so much you don't know about mm -hmm. how the world works that I've just gradually had my eyes opened by mm -hmm. working class and poor people who had lived through things that I didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. So I think you start at a deficit, the more class privilege you have, mm -hmm. you start from a deeper level of, of ignorance of how class works in the society and why mm -hmm. it's harmful to have such big inequities um, and so much classism. Um, on the other hand, you know, we say all, all class cultures give you gifts that you can bring. Um, and one example um, that I would say is that I, I got a lot of self-confidence from growing up upper middle class. Mm -hmm. I, I got told, oh, you can do anything if you work hard in school, mm -hmm. you can go to the best college. I, you know, um, I, uh, I think that I took in that, that confidence so that when I've had these, and you know, I had the idea for this research project, for this book, for these workshops, mm -hmm. um, that 
it wasn't a struggle for me to say, well, if I have an idea, it's mm -hmm. probably a good enough idea to pursue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas for lots of uh, my colleagues who grew up working class or poor, there's such um, you know internalized classism of, of self doubt, yeah. low self worth, belief that, or just even if uh, you know your own idea is good. You don't believe it's anybody else is going to be convinced of it or fund it or anything right. like that. So, so I do appreciate getting that confidence, and I hope that I am putting that towards the common good. Right. To to your research, um, you researched some twenty five organizations, organizations composed of members from a variety of classes, um, and found that members' class of origin as well as their current classes um, were the best indicators of how groups would deal with particular issues. Um, but it begs a question, and that is, why does it matter to us in the first place to be aware of how class differences play out around us? Right. Um, well, it matters um, because uh, the absence of of class awareness within social justice groups, the absence of open talk about class, is leaving a lot of class dynamics undiscussed, mm -hmm. um, power differences, informal forms of power that people with more education and class privilege have um, within groups. Um, and given that all class cultures give us gifts, it's leaving some gifts unrecognized and untapped. Mm -hmm. And even some networks of like, who do you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I discovered that most of the activists in these 25 groups um, weren't aware um, of the class background of a lot of their fellow group members. Mm -hmm. uh, they were off a little bit in guessing what was the class composition of their group. Mm -hmm. And um, so there were secrets. I think there's secrets in any gathering of people about mm -hmm. class that people habitually don't say, you know, privileges, at, don't say that, oh yeah, my parents have a home in Switzerland that we go to every summer, or, mm -hmm. or I'm going to inherit $25 million. And people don't habitually say, Oh yeah, I went bankrupt a few years ago. I was homeless for a while. I was on welfare. That the, the, you know, if you don't know people very well, there's not a high degree of trust. You just leave those things out of the story, sure, sure. and so there's this kind of assumption: oh, we're all more or less alike, mm -hmm. which is often not true. Yeah. So we're missing out on some of the gifts and strengths that people can bring mm -hmm. um, from the, of the social networks, of the class cultural strengths. And of course, in a mixed class group, whose cultural strengths are going to be most overlooked mm -hmm. is going to be working class and poor people, either by background or um, lifelong working class and poor right. activists. Let's actually, let's actually jump to that. Um, at, the end of, at the end of your book, you imagine sort of uh, an ideal future where um, members of groups, regardless of their class, bring to that group the, the strengths that their class has given them. And frequently, you know, we'll, we, certainly our language is, is very instructive and very insightful into how we feel about these things. Um, you know, we can say upper class or lower class, we can say um, rednecks, etc., uh, etc. Et Very loaded uh, language to describe how our culture values particular right. classes. Yeah, but I at the end of the book, you bring out the the gifts right. of of the various classes, and it's instructive for all of us to hear sort of what those are, per particularly for us to hear about the be the, the the gifts of classes that we don't necessarily. And, and interface with. What are the what are the gifts of, of the various classes as, as you see them? If, uh, if we can if we can get all the strengths in one spot. Um, yeah, I don't think I could say them all in yeah, the, yeah, in yeah. a short sure. time, but I can give examples. Sure. Um, and um, well, the the lifelong um, working class and poor activists um, in the study. Um, once I knew who they, they were, it was so clear um, that they talked really differently um, mm -hmm. than college educated activists mm -hmm. um, in a much more colorful and lively way mm -hmm. that actually is very good for persuading people uh, mm -hmm. of a progressive issue, uh, people of any class. Um, they used fewer of the abstract generalizations that fill up the speech 
of college educated right. professionals. Right. Um, so that's a strength. Mm -hmm. um, there were different, there were humor differences. There was a lot more teasing um, and um, as a way of, of keeping the group bonded mm -hmm. with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there was a lot more focus on um, the inherent pleasures of meetings, um, mm. like serving food at meetings, and on um, having a realistic plan that your your activist efforts are going to do some real good for somebody in particular in the short run. Mm. Um, that then that can sometimes get lost sure. in the college educated professionals activism, um, which didn't mean that um, the working class and poor activists didn't have longer term vision or bigger analysis, but you, you know, it, it just didn't make sense to be part of a group if there wasn't a plan that was going to help somebody in mm -hmm. trouble in mm -hmm. the short run sure. as well. So I, I think those are just, that's a small sub list. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very important to highlight uh, the working class and poor activists' strengths um, because we're, we're told, oh, everybody should aspire to be just like the middle class mm, and mm -hmm. to see, you know, nothing like in schools, oh, these kids need remedial mm -hmm. um, academics and mm -hmm. um, behavioral interventions and just to see working class culture as a mess of deficits, which is comp right. it's not true. I mean, there's right. strengths and limitations everywhere. But um, so it's really important to point out Mm -hmm. that middle class and upper class, upper middle class and um, owning class cultures also have downsides. But since you asked me the strengths, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. well, I think that the kinds of um, big picture framing um, more facility with, um, with abstract generalizations, especially the ones that really pack a lot of analysis and mm -hmm. um, vision into them. Um, the practice that you get in college um, with kicking around ideas and thinking longer term right. um, are, is really, really useful. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of groups had um, a sort of behind the scenes, even community organizing groups and um, labor organizing, um, had some college educated um, mostly women sort of um, holding things together operationally, mm -hmm. sort of ha thinking about organizational development, thinking about management. Um, and so I think a lot of us get told, you're going to grow up and you're going to manage something. Mm -hmm. um, and our jobs give us a lot of practice with that that's very useful for mm -hmm. activism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So being kind of the pillar, right. um, especially lower professional white women were often who was holding that up. But it mm -hmm. was a variety of college-educated mm -hmm. mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, so I think so there were, are those are some strengths. OK. Um, you know, that said, to be honest, um, most of us live amongst people like ourselves. Uh, however we define that, it's class, it's income, it's education, it's race. Um, how likely are we, do you believe, to become fluent in the languages of other classes um, when we lead relatively isolated lives? How can we, how can we break, it? and the follow-up, I guess, is how can we break out of that? Yeah. Right. And it's good that you mentioned race as one of the ways. So we, our, our society continues to be racially segregated sure. as well as class. But I do think that it's a little bit different um, that um, African Americans and Latinos and other people of color um, live a little bit less class segregated lives by mm -hmm. and large mm -hmm. um, that uh, so often there's the, the one person who's gone to college, gone into a profession as a homeowner, but their extended family will include people who are still working class or poor mm -hmm. um, and um, there are more mixed class neighborhoods that are majority people of color. Mm -hmm. So I think the, 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 the people um, are most having that problem of mm -hmm. like, gee, how would I organize a class diverse group when mm -hmm. I don't know anybody of a different class? Right. I think it's more of a white people issue. Um, sure. And um, it's, it's really serious. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we, to, you have to break it. I mean, you have to break out of that. Mm -hmm. So my goal, <clears throat> excuse me, my overall goal in writing Missing Class and working with Class Action is to build a movement for social justice in this country mm -hmm. that's strong enough to really make systemic change. And um, that can only be a mixed class and mixed race movement, otherwise it's not going to be big enough. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and also, you, because you can't solve a problem 
without hearing the voices of the people affected by the problem. Mm -hmm. So many of our problems in this country, disproportionately the harm falls on working class and poor people and people of color. So you've just, you know, diversity in movement Organ social movement organizations has to just be everyone's goal, right. um, and it, if you if you if you start a group with pro, you know college educated professional mm -hmm. um, people, that's gonna and you meet in the suburbs or whatever. It's gonna be hard. So right. one thing is just to um, find um, progressive groups whose causes you support that have grown up with um, local leadership in, in, in grassroots communities and say um, either I'm going to go as an individual and uh, join that group and give them a hand and uh -huh. raise money for them or whatever, or our group that we think, oh, instead of going, oh, we're so not diverse, we're so not diverse, uh -huh. to say, well, let's go and partner or let's go and volunteer. Let's go ask them what help they mm -hmm. need and what mm -hmm. they would want from a partner group mm -hmm. out here in the suburbs or wherever, mm -hmm. um, in Arlington, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that model, some of the groups I studied had discovered that model, that um, there were um, community organizing groups and, and unions that had gone seeking uh, more class privileged partner groups mm -hmm. um, and teamed up and formed coalitions. Um, and there were um, groups started by college educated um, professionals that had gone out looking for mm -hmm. um, grassroots groups to partner with. So mm -hmm. I think that's a good model. Right. Are there are there any progressive groups in the Arlington area that you would that you would offer as um, as possible ideas for Arlingtonians who might be watching or or um, Arlington? I'm not sure, um, but. Um, uh, definitely in the greater Boston area. There's mm -hmm, some fantastic mm -hmm. um, cross-class groups. Mm -hmm. um, I'm partial to City Life Vida Urbana, which mm -hmm. I um, that works in Jamaica Plain that right. I worked for back in the 80s. Okay. Um, that uh, there's room for people of every class and sticking up for an eviction-free and foreclosure-free um, Jamaica Plain. Nice. Um, so that's a really good one. And of course, the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, by, by organizing faith-based communities, um, mm -hmm. and I think a number of Arlington churches are, are um, involved with GBIO, mm -hmm. um, that started out cross-class and has, has remained that way. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's two. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, you, you've, you've used the term social movements, uh, social movement groups. Uh, you can you know, think of it as social justice groups um, that your research was focused on. Um, but it would it be fair to generalize uh, your findings to more everyday sort of settings, uh, be it religious congregation, a student group, a union, um, anywhere people of different class backgrounds work together? Can we? Or anywhere anyone works together and counts on volunteer energy. Okay. And anyone who's in a, a group that involves volunteers and people giving their time for anything, mm -hmm. um, yeah, definitely including a religious um, mm -hmm. group or a parents group or neighborhood group mm -hmm. will find missing class very useful because a lot of it is just how to get groups to function better. Sure. Um, and I think the problems are the same. I focused on social justice groups um, with, you know, prog on varied progressive issues because that's who gives me you know, hope that there's mm -hmm. going to be a better future. Sure. Um, but absolutely, the that's one thing I discovered is that um, regardless of class and re and race, and regardless of the of the issue that, that your group is working on, all the groups had the same problems. Mm -hmm. They had problems with low turnout, like where is everybody? They had mm -hmm. problems of inactive members. They had problems of people who talk too much. I, sure. I discovered that I had to have an overtalkers chapter because mm -hmm. that's what all the interviewees wanted to talk about was sure. the people who talk too much at meetings. So I think anyone who goes to meetings will find it a very useful book. Right. Good, good. Well, let's let it, to to wrap up uh, the vision of your organization, Class Action, is a world without classism. So maybe you can leave us with a vision of what such a world might look like. Yeah, um, we um, we we developed that vision, and it's on our homepage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it it does give us a sense of like 
the tiny steps we're taking today mm -hmm. are moving us towards this this mm -hmm. really inspiring vision. So mm -hmm. in a world without classism, everyone would be treated with respect and mm -hmm. dignity, and mm -hmm. everyone would have an opportunity to develop their own human potential. Mm -hmm. There would be way, way, way less um, economic inequality and inequality of status and power and mm -hmm. um, opportunity, um, and everyone would have a say in um, the decisions that affect their lives. Mm -hmm. So it, all aspects of society would have more of a democratic or um, participatory aspect so that um, decisions are not that just things that are done to you. Right. Um, and, and yeah, we would, so it would be a world of human flourishing, mm -hmm. of human needs getting met and human mm -hmm. potential being realized. And to get there, we not only have to get rid of the um, you know, systemic class, uh, the, the systems that are creating so much class inequality, yeah. um, because all these um, isms are interconnected, the world without classism won't be reached without getting rid of racism, sexism, mm -hmm. and every other form of right. systemic oppression. So it's a pretty tall oh, order. Yeah. But a step at a time. But one step at a time. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. My Appreciate pleasure. And I trust Arling Arlingtonians will as well. For Betsy Leander Wright, I'm Peter Bermudis for Arlington Public News.